an average day in in my world chaotic you know you never know what to anticipate from moment to moment people call you on the phone they expect you to be the, uh, able to solve anything that they throw at you sometimes you can sometimes you can't I've experienced everything from natural disasters with tornadoes and um, man-made disasters, murders, um, kidnappings. Seen some pretty unique cases. At 3.30 in the afternoon on January 29, 2013, 65-year-old Jimmy Lee Dykes boarded public school bus 04-2 as it turned around near his property in Midland City, Alabama. He pointed this Ruger handgun at the bus driver, Charles Poland, and handed him a note. The ensuing kidnapping and standoff lasted seven days, was covered around the clock on television, and involved hundreds of law enforcement personnel. The FBI called it one of the toughest hostage scenarios they had ever faced. You know, I always question why people do the things that they do. And I took that approach with that situation because I really wanted to know. Hey, you ain't got nothing time. Do it. I can't. They won't be hurting if you let it. If you do it. I need two kids. Two, two my boys. Responsibility to keep I need two boys. Kids on this bus. Less than a minute after Jim Dykes boarded the school bus, 16-year-old Trey Watts called 911 from the second to the last row. He reached dispatcher Britton Norris in the basement of the Dale County Sheriff's Office. She had been on the job less than a month. 911, where's your emergency? Um, I don't know. We're on the bus and someone's trying to take our kids. He has a gun? Yes, ma'am. Where's the guy with the gun now? He's at the bus door. He's aiming the gun at the bus driver? He's the back, yes, what, what's the name of your bus? You're the girl with that boy right there. Come here. 4-2. No, he's scared. Uh -huh. He's scared. Uh-huh. You will not you will not be harmed, son. You will not be harmed, son. I'm sorry, I cannot. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to shoot now. Come on, I don't have any time. The goddamn law's coming. Come on! Okay, what's he doing? No! He's going, he's going to love her. Don't! No, no! Come on! Come on! Come on! Oh my gosh, what's going on? What's up, Jay? What? What's up, Jay? Oh my gosh, hang in there, baby. Hang in there, just get down. Get down. What's he doing now, honey? He took a kid. He took a kid. He got a kid. The man is down in there, Robbie. He has a gun and he met a little kid. Ma'am, who is this little kid? The little boy's name is Ethan. 911. Yeah, yeah, uh, I have a hostage. Uh, I got the on the phone. And it, I'm in a underground bunker. Yes, sir. When the cops, when the cops get here, they stop at the front gate. Yes. And talk to a white post, a uh, white TV site, eyes sticking up. I'm sorry I had to shoot that bus driver. I told them there wouldn't be any harm to anybody. And there will not be any harm to the kids. But I'm, I'm going to say something, and I, I, I won't be talking on the phone anymore. Hard to understand, I guess you would say. You know, if I want to tell you something, I tell you. You know, but it was something he felt important enough that he wanted to put it out to the world. Just before 4 p.m. yesterday, we responded to a shooting on a Dale County school bus and discovered that the suspect had fled the scene with a small child. The details of this situation are limited, but I can assure you, at this time, we have no reason to believe that the child has been harmed. By that evening, television crews and reporters had arrived from around the country. An FBI critical incident response unit flew in from Virginia and set up camp at the nearby Destiny Church. Lieutenant Bill Rafferty, a local sheriff's deputy who was among the first on the scene, was in charge of talking with Dykes. It was his first hostage negotiation. He wanted a female reporter to come into the bunker. He made this quite clear on throughout the whole crisis. A female reporter had to come into the bunker so he could tell his story. Police didn't know very much about Jimmy Lee Dykes or what he intended to say. He was divorced and estranged from his two daughters 
He'd been in the Navy and had been awarded a Good Conduct Medal for service during the Vietnam War. He lived in a rundown white trailer on the edge of a peanut field in rural Alabama. He had built the bunker by hand. It was 12 feet underground and smaller than a parking space, with electricity, food, and water to last for weeks, and a homemade bomb that dykes could detonate should police try to break in. Everything just kept playing back in your mind. You're searching for answers, trying to just put it all together to make sense out of it. How we were going to save that little boy from a hole in the ground that was six foot wide by eight foot long by 12 foot high. One way in and one way out. As the second day turned into the third and the fourth, very little changed. Still hoping for a peaceful solution, the FBI tracked down Cindy Dykes, Jim's older daughter. It had been more than 25 years since she had last seen her dad. Her mother, Dyke's ex-wife, had died only a few weeks earlier. They called and informed me that my dad had murdered somebody and had kidnapped a child and was down in a bunker. And I told them whatever they needed, because I, I have a little boy at the same age. Um, I was willing to do anything. There was two young FBI agents and they were driving a black SUV. They came in, they picked me up and we drove for hours and hours. I brought pictures of my children, um, pictures of me and him, um, pictures of me when I was a baby. And I wouldn't say that my dad was violent towards me at all, but he was very violent towards my mom. My dad had actually put her in a hospital a couple of times, so she had to leave or eventually he'd kill her. Like my mom told me one time, she said, I wished I could just go in and open him up and take that little bad thing out and close him back up. And I wish she could have done that too. He had nobody. He had nobody or nothing. I, I thought if I said, look, even in jail, you have a family and I'll come and see you every day or every week and the kids will come and see you. I mean, I don't necessarily know if that would have been the case, but that's what I was going to tell him. Dykes called me just, you got to get this child out. You got to get this boy out of here. You got to do what you got to do and you got to do it now so you can get this boy out of here. And I said, what's going on? And he says, he told me he loved me. And that really bothered Dykes that Ethan had said that, that he'd become attached to him. Let's make it safe for Ethan. Well, well, I just we want don't to, want to do anything to tarnish your story. Well, I want this on record, and I just want the world to know if anything happens like that, you know who's going to be responsible. I'm listening. Okay. You're right. That's it, OK? Okay, Jim. I got what you're saying. All right, thanks. Okay. I don't, hey. Yeah. That is not a threat, and that's absolutely the last goddamn thing I would ever do. Uh, if, if that was to happen, if, if, if anything, if, if I was responsible for him, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go through this. I'd just take myself out with my damn nine millimeter, okay? Okay, I hear you. But I, I couldn't, <laughs> I could live. I could live myself in two seconds. I'd, I'd kill myself if you know, anything like that happened to him. Okay. You make sure that he stays. Please make sure he stays. I'm going to. We don't want anything I'm, to happen to that little boy. I'm going to. You know, Jim. I know you don't know me other than us talking over the last several days, but I give you my word, nothing will happen. Nothing's going to happen. It's hard to. It's hard to distance yourself from so much evil and darkness when that person's your dad, you know. Um, you just think, how, how can I be a part of something that done something so terrible? Between y'all two, just for safety of both of y'all, you'll just leave, talk, call Mr. Emery. Dykes had a history of making threats and a record of violence. On November 16, 2011, Sheriff's Deputy Mason Bynum responded to a call that Dykes was arguing with the property owner over who had the right to pecans that had fallen by the roadside. I mean, he's an absolute, he's an absolute idiot if he thinks a lot that you're not supposed to. This is 
What if I grow in bananas there? You can't pick up bananas either, then, could you? I don't reckon so. If you can't what, pick what, up pecans. What, what have you got? Grapevines traveling across the power line that falls over. It belongs, it belongs over there, but the hell the vine runs over yonder. It's dropping on that right away. I couldn't pick them up. That's insane. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so damn stupid, it's funny. He was against everything unless it directly dealt with him in the way that he wanted it to. So much hatred. Yeah, and we really don't know exactly what he hated so bad, other than the government. When you got people at the top that don't even know why the system is supposed to run, well, they shit on all the people down at the bottom, and that's just I'm in the bottom too now. So and the only reason is that I'm having to leave here now is because they don't want to stand up and be what they're hired to do up there in that office of power. Because well, you can call and give them a chance. I mean, well, that's just the way the law is. Okay. On February 3rd, the day of bus driver Charles Poland's funeral. Jim Dyke set a deadline. He gave police until 5.30 the following afternoon to provide a female TV reporter to broadcast his manifesto. The FBI refused, and a profiler concluded that Dykes would most likely kill Ethan and himself. You know, Dykes was a man of his word. He told Charles Poland that, you don't know, turn over these two children, you know, and I'm going to have to kill you. Well, he did that. We had no reason to believe that he would not follow through with his threat. His attitude, even toward me, had changed. Uh, there was no really bringing him down from his aggravation, his madness. Just for everybody, it's just to control every goddamn body and play one race against another and one class against a goddamn other, and that's what, and you people are fucking scared. You know goddamn well that what I say when I go public, you're going to create. Chaos. And I know damn well that's what you people are scared of, is the truth. We, um, we went forward. When everything began, that's when you knew when there was no backing up. They called me at 7 o'clock in the morning and had me come down and said that they thought it was time for me to talk to him because I had been preparing, you know, these days to do that, all these days. It was me, Bill, my dad's negotiator, and Anthony, my negotiator. The FBI took Cindy to a truck near the Dykes' property and gave her a laptop they said would allow her to have a video call with her father. Agents passed a second device to Dykes himself through the hatch on the top of the bunker. I saw him grab it, but, but the tablet was facing the opposite direction. So I could see wherever he was going, but I couldn't see him. So I saw him go down the ladder, and then I saw him turn away from the ladder and walk into the darkness of the bunker. Bill went to slide the tablet into my lap, and he said, Jim, and I heard my dad say, yes, and um, he said, I have your daughter Cynthia here, and she's ready to talk to you, and he said, um, like, oh good, or okay, or hold, hold on for a second, or something, like he was gonna get situated, and then we heard, boom, and then there was a bunch of commotion, and uh, they went and put me back in the little room where we always sat and talked, and then um, Anthony came in there and told me that, um, that if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have been able to get him out. I'm sorry, your dad was a casualty. I had to kill him, so. FBI agents detonated explosive charges to tear loose the hatch. The first agent got stuck halfway down the entry shaft. Dykes fired round after round at point-blank range. Every shot missed. The agents retreated, and four minutes later, on the agent's second entry attempt, he found Ethan in the smoke and darkness and wrapped himself around the boy. His team followed close behind, and after a hand-to-hand -hand struggle, shot Dykes a dozen times, killing him. Ethan and his rescuers were unharmed. I've, I've never had a nightmare over it. You know, did a lot of reflecting at first when it was over with. Uh, I can't say I felt sympathy for him. Do I hate that he died? Yes. But that was his decision, not ours. Um, am I happy that 
Ethan's here today? Definitely yes. But it was not because Jimmy Lee Dykes allowed it that way. I don't know if they had really any intentions of letting me talk to him. I don't know if that was really the case. I feel that they had to do whatever they had to do. This is a little, this is a baby in there. I understand that. I just didn't want to be, I didn't want to be the one that they used. You have to wonder what went wrong. You know, you have to wonder what makes someone sit there and go through the process of planning something like this and what kind of person it took to, to take the time to figure out what would work, what would not work. I would like to have the answers to why he got to the point he did, but you, know, you probably won't ever get that, never. <laughs>